Here we go. Jake and Josh are here to analyze the game they love for the team they love. This is another Dolphins Podcast. Here's your host, Jake Mendel and Josh House. Welcome into another edition of another Dolphins Podcast. We have made it, everyone. Games are here. It may be practice it may be dress rehearsal for some but it also is for us so we are diving right into it it is officially falcons week and it's been a little unique because the miami dolphins and the atlanta falcons have been practicing together on the same field in south florida and we have all the news and notes all the dire information we need to know about the atlanta falcons and the miami dolphins ahead of friday's game but before i get into all that it's summer everyone's been taking vacations but we're all finally back Joshua Houts, Merrick Brave. I've missed seeing this trio uh, yelling at, at a TV screen. I, I'm happy to be back with you guys. My first episode with y'all in a couple weeks. I actually took a vacation out to the East Coast. I'm a Midwest guy, you know, an Iowa guy. But uh, I'm originally from the East Coast, so I took a little vacation out there specifically just to hang out with both you, Jake, and Josh. Uh, and you guys ducked me all week long. I, I, I was driving all around Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, and I, I just couldn't find you. I was looking for the, the aqua hats in the distance, and I, I couldn't see you. You, 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 guys, uh, you guys left me hanging. What's up with that? Yeah, I was in Ocean City. That was my bad. Family vacation was already planned. I knew that we were getting ready to hang out, so I had to go to a whole different state just so we didn't uh, tear shit up. I'm going to be completely honest with you here. Can you take a screenshot of the, the path you traveled and send it to Mike McDaniel? Because it was a master class of avoiding us despite going through both of our states. It was, it was amazing. Wild. You were like, hey, I'm, I'm going to be near Philly. And he's like, Josh is like, how far away? And he's like, four hours away. And then all of a sudden it was, you're going to be in Massachusetts. How far away? Four hours. It was, it was just... <laughs> If Tyree Kill was running that route, man, it'd be a touchdown. So much open space, uh, no defenders anywhere near him. It was a good time. Uh, it was it was a fun vacation. It was nice to be out there and see all the sights. But I'm excited to be back be back here with you guys. Excited to talk Dolphins football. Hopefully, I was able to keep up with all the news on. Uh, what is this app called now? X. I, I got back from vacation, and all of a sudden, my bird's gone. There's just a, a black and white. Dx. Text. I don't even know what's happening anymore, but uh, I tried to keep up with with practice news and notes, and uh, and uh, I've been back for a couple of days now, so I, I should be on my game. If I'm not, we're just going to blame the East Coast air. That's what we'll blame it on. Josh, what's the um, if you're on this app and you're what what do you do on this app? Can you can you say that word for me? I just say you're Zeton. Zeton, we're going with Zeton. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you've said it, but I wanted to hear you pronounce it because I'm, I'm riding and dying. It, it is yeah. Zeton for now on. I'm 100% on board for that. Guys, we've been doing this for a long time in terms of watching the Dolphins go through training camp. And I just got to say, the last 10 years, uh, the growth just in the coverage of training camp has gotten absolutely bananas. And I wanted to just get you guys' thoughts before we start because here's a hot take for you. I don't know if you're ready for this one. I think training camp we slightly over cover it just a bit too much i'd love to hear your guys thoughts. <laughs> uh, i would agree yeah i think uh, there's a lot of people out there living and dying with each uh zeet as, as josh has <laughs> has begun calling them so now we all will but uh you know we, with each post on social media we're all living and dying like, oh no incomplete pass from tua oh no uh, mike white look looks terrible what a what a waste of a signing and oh no uh Eric Azucama is injured and he'll never play for the, Oh wait, no, he's back again the next day. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think we all need to just take a step back, realize it's practice, you know, like Allen Iverson would say, would say it's, it's just practice, man. It's practice. What are we doing here? Um, they're, they're trying new things. They're, they're, they're maybe uh, making some passes or attempting some passes. They, that they wouldn't in a regular season game They're the, it's situational football. You know, they're, they're respotting the ball after, after turnovers or first downs or whatever, you know, that should, that should indicate that maybe they're not taking it as seriously as we are in some instances, uh, which is pretty wild. But I remember just a few years ago, Bill Belichick and the Patriots got penalized for filming another team's practice. And now each team's own fan base is filming the practices <laughs> and, and posting the videos on social media for the world and opposing uh, coaches and coordinators to, to to dissect and 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 get intel on 
uh, interdivision games there. That seems a little weird to me, but it, it is cool to see the videos though. So I don't know. I don't know which side of the fence I'm on for that uh, discussion, but it, yeah, it's wild. It's training camp. We're all just starved for football and now it's back. And so we're consuming, consuming, consume, consuming like the football gluttons we are. Yeah, we're obsessed with it. And I do miss those days when it was a lot harder to get some of this information, right? I mean, nobody likes to cover the Dolphins from afar more than I do, you know, to pretend to be a beat writer and all this. But it was nice to have to go on Twitter and have to see this beat writer's feed to even know that any of this stuff happens. Nowadays, um, you got me posting clips from from Pennsylvania. (laughs) Someone sent them to me. So, um, yeah, different times for sure. But we all just want football back in our life. And uh, I think we're finally on our path to getting there, aren't we? I just kind of think of it like I go back to like 2014, let's say. Actually, what what year? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll even go to like 2016. I just miss just like we didn't have the down to town detail of like, hey, okay, so on this play, it was a Liam Eichenberg false start. And then Tua bobbled the ball for half a second. And then he looked one way. But all we got was like this drone picture of someone like skying in the air in the end zone and catching a ball for a touchdown. And it left so much the imagination. Uh, I can compare that to something else. I'm not going to go there. Uh, but it, there was just so much left where you're like, wow, that looks so cool. I wonder how that play went. But all of a sudden that sick catch of someone catching a ball in the back of the end zone, we get to hear about the false start, the fumble, the juggle, Just because we are in a situation where we need to look at everything. It's practice. People are going to make mistakes. There are going to be issues uh, along those lines. With that being said, as we sit here and say that don't overreact about this stuff, I want to ask you guys both. There's probably someone on every single NFL franchise who spends the next three weeks going around every single, probably like the king of Finland, Finland, Finland. Just looking at his feed, just trying to break down these plays like that that has to be happening in the league. So it's just so crazy how we have both uh, sides of the equation just being so perfect at the same time. Yeah, I mean, we are a rabid bunch Dolphins fans. You do wonder, though, like, are, are, are we one of the most rabid fan bases out there? We're always winning those those Twitter slash X polls where people are voting on which team's going to advance in these virtual playoffs and yada, 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 yada. The, the Dolphins always run away with that. Are other fan bases as bad as the Dolphins fan base? You know, I got an terms? answer. Yeah. Uh, what the Dolphins don't have in the trenches, their fan base does. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Well, you know, we do push around these other fan bases online. So uh, maybe maybe we could transfer some of that energy to Liam Eikenberg uh, and see if he actually pans out at left guard, which by all accounts, and we'll probably get into it, it's not looking so good for the, the former fighting Irishman. I think that is enough nonsense from me. The one thing we hear quite a bit, The one thing we always hear about training camp, especially when we see teams fighting against each other, is we just get tired of facing the same guy practice after practice. It gets so repetitive, you start to kind of take the focus out of it. That all changed as we see teams have these two, three times a week scrimmages ahead of a preseason game. I think a lot of the players see it as a refreshing uh, twist. It gives you a challenge. You're competing against another team. And at the end of the day, there are always going to be fights at training camp. The PR is better if it's against a different team. So let's get into it. The Dolphins are two days into their joint practices with the Atlanta Falcons. And guys, we can't overreact about the preseason. But hearing this line from D. Orlando Ledbetter, uh, covers the Atlanta Falcons, just warmed my heart. During the one-on-one portion of practice, Hill, Waddle, Braxton Berrios, and Eric Ezukama all caught deep balls against the Atlanta Falcons. If that isn't the perfect lead to say what we'd love to see out of this Miami Dolphins offense, I don't know what else to tell you. Yeah, I think you'd rather see it in 7-on-7s or 11-on-11s. I think those one-on-one drills are definitely designed to make quarterbacks and receivers look good. But, I mean, catching those deep balls is a lot better than not connecting on those deep balls, and especially with all the crap other fan bases like to talk about our quarterback, Tua Tunga Bailoa. Uh, you, you, you do like to see uh, these types of things. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're not going to complain about uh, Dolphins receivers uh, smoking Falcons DBs out here in one-on-ones, are we? 
No, not at all, because that tis the season to get hyped about this stuff. So inject it into my veins when I heard that, I got real excited. Even I think they showed a clip of Tyree Kill breaking someone's ankles, and this was one of those routes like we talked about, Jake, where they posted Xavier Howard getting beat on like uh, the guy who ran for like a route for 20 seconds was wide open. This was Hill just you know dogging some of these guys. So it's what you want to see. But again, it was those uh, you know 11 on 11, those seven on sevens that really tested the Dolphins and pushed them to their limit. At least that's the way it sounded. So I, I kind of think of that kid, um, I, I forgot his name, that was in the Little League World Series a few years back, just talking about dingers only. Dingers are the only thing that matters, and that's what baby the stuff Gronk, right? is baby Gronk. It's like, Yeah, <laughs> there's Baby Gronk, there's Baby Diggs, they, there's a whole crew of them. But just the Dolphins offense is going about this uh, dingers only mindset, and, and I'm here for it, but I do have to agree. Um, yeah, there was one play going around the internet, and I kind of felt bad for the Falcons DB, because if you have to do a play that is more than – three seconds and you have to follow Tyree kill around you're doomed. If you have to follow like 80% of wide receivers around for more than four seconds, you're doomed. So they're kind of fun to see, but, but it's important to keep that context. I think practicing with the Atlanta Falcons has worked so well because we hear the coaching staff say this, the Miami dolphins are that speedy finesse team where the Atlanta Falcons, they have struggled the last couple of years. You get those higher draft picks and they've done it the old fashioned way, building in the trenches, getting those defensive linemen, offensive linemen, and really building out the roster that way. So guys, how have you seen this battle between the, the two different styles of teams, the finesse dolphins and, and that quote unquote physical Atlanta Falcons? Well, I mean, today there were actually some reports that the Dolphins offensive line started winning some of their one-on-one -on -one, uh, blocking matchups with the Falcons defensive linemen. And that uh, I can't remember who it was, if it was Marcel or if it was uh, Joe Shad or, or somebody like that. Uh, but they said the Dolphins offensive line came out today and they were playing like they were pissed off. And he capitalized uh -oh. pissed off. So you that's for emphasis. So, you know, uh, you know, after – after, you know, they kind of lived up to that finesse moniker, um, like you mentioned earlier, Jake, uh, during the first day of joint practices, the offensive line came out in day two and, and apparently had their way uh, during some portions of practice with the Falcons uh, defensive line. And by all accounts, they have a pretty decent defensive line. So you do like to see that. And if there was one spot on this Dolphins roster that we're all uh, feeling a little Joe Philbin queasy about. It's that offensive line, and it has been that for the last couple seasons, and it continues to be that this season and, and this offseason. We've seen a lot of negative press surrounding that Dolphins offensive line. So it was good, uh, in a vacuum at least, to see that the Dolphins offensive line responded today, came out there with their big boy pants on, and, and pushed around the Falcons defensive line a little bit. Didn't poop them. No. <laughs> And it sounds like from, I mean, again, we're watching from afar, Northeast and Midwest. I mean, we're not in practice by any means, but it sounds like from those that were there, you know, Omar Kelly mentioned the defense and offense both won the day on both sides of the ball. Again, today, I think he said the same thing about um, day one, whatever that means. I mean, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, but the fact that, you know, Omar Kelly's kind of stoked for what he saw. I mean, that says, that speaks volumes. I also have written down that Isaiah Wynn, he continues to surprise, mm -hmm. sounds like he could fill in there at left guard. I have written down at Liam Eikenberg's cheeks. I think it was Omar Kelly that said he hasn't won a single rep or something like that. So um, it seems like it's a back and forth, you know, uh, duel between these two. It sounds like the defense has gotten the better of uh, the Atlanta Falcons offense. I know we all saw the clip where Xavier Howard's like, they asked him about, I think Dalton Ritter. And he's just like, yeah, who ne never heard of him. He you said his name wrong too. You're in the same boat. <laughs> what, what I do, what, what, I, what I say. Desmond. called him Dalton. His name's Desmond. I, Desmond. Yeah. Yeah. I should know that. Cause he's a, he's a quarterback with a visor. So he's a, he's a game changer, but um, yeah, neither of us know his name. <laughs> Merrick, I'm glad we have an orange jersey expert here. So we have we have two bites He's at here. this pizza here. That and I want to start with the first bite because the second bite is very interesting and is something we haven't seen before. Um, but positive sign here. First day of the practices against the Falcons, Jerome Baker was sitting there in that orange jersey. We've heard a little bit of David Long hype. We even heard some conversation about him getting the jersey, and I think consistency was brought up. So how do we feel? Uh, what does it kind of tell us about this Dolphins defense when someone like Jerome Baker hits that field, especially when you're facing another team wearing that uh, unique jersey? 
Well, I'm glad you bring up the orange jersey, Jake, because while I was away, you manned my very prestigious orange jersey award tracker article that is done uh, during every Dolphins practice uh, on thefinsider.com, where we all write. Uh, And you manned that for me, so I do appreciate that. And then the Dolphins uh, came back this week. They started with Jerome Baker, like you said, um, which I thought was interesting because a lot of a lot of um, a lot of people within the fan base, but even also national me- media members and whatnot, they think the linebacking core is going to be a weakness for this Dolphins defense. And I always kind of took umbrage with that because I like Jerome Baker as a player, and I think that he. Uh, you know, his speed and his his ranginess kind of helps a, and fits this Fangio scheme a little bit. And I thought David Long Jr. was a very underrated signing this offseason. And despite, you know, him battling some hamstring issues earlier on this offseason, he seems to be performing really, really well uh, right now uh, in training camp. So that those are both positive signs. Uh, for this Dolphins defense moving forward. Uh, And then they came out today, and we didn't see an orange jersey at all. Not a single player uh, was wearing the orange jersey. Mike McDaniel was just looking out for me today. He wanted me to take a day off from from the writing. You know, I I slave over those orange jersey articles for hours on end uh, before, before they can come out, which is why they're always, you know, roughly three to four hours later than the news breaks on Elon Musk's X app. Um, but yeah, no orange Jersey award winner today for the Miami dolphins on day two of joint practices with the Atlanta Falcons. And, uh, Tua actually was asked about that during his, uh, availability after the practice was over. Uh, and he said he didn't know. He was like, Oh, I good catch. I didn't even realize there wasn't an orange Jersey today. So you do wonder, uh, if it was a message being sent from Mike McDaniel to his team, a subtle message apparently because he didn't. It's not like he used it as a talking point. Do you think he's lying? Do you think Tua's lying? I kind of think Tua's lying saying that. Do you think Tua just lies sometimes because he's like, I don't want to talk about. I, it. Yeah, let's this just end this conversation. Get out of my face. I, he I looked, think that might be epic. He that. looked annoyed during today's press or availability. He looked annoyed and like a handful of questions he definitely dismissed like that. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't know who cares, whatever. Like I'm, it's hot. Let me go in and take a shower and go home to see my baby and my pregnant wife. Like they just ask him some, some dumb shit out there. Sorry. But, uh, but yeah, no orange Jersey today. It could have been a message or maybe uh, somebody, I think on, on, on the social media, they surmised that, or they were guessing that it was uh, maybe uh, a way to not disrespect the Falcons in some way to say, Oh yeah, this guy dominated you yesterday. Cause it actually did sound like Tyreek Hill had a pretty dominant performance during uh, day one of joint practices. So I thought maybe he would get the orange today, uh, but nobody did. So uh, no article from me today on the finsider.com, but. I think he was definitely trying to send a message, but I, I mean, apparently too, it didn't really take <laughs> note of it. Care. And I thought Mike McDaniel's comment when he asked um if the goal was to be average, this is what he said about day one. If the goal was to be average, then I was super pumped. I really enjoy <laughs> joint practices because I want everyone's best effort. There was stuff that irritated me and stuff that pumped me up. So um, it sounded like he wasn't very pleased with that first uh, day, the joint practices. So maybe it was him sending a message. But if Tua Tagovailoa had no idea that there was no one wearing an orange jersey, I think his first comment was who was controlling the music. So, I mean, I don't know how much of a, <laughs> a message was sent there, but um, hopefully I've, we'll see who comes out tomorrow or yeah, I guess tomorrow if they're back on the field. Josh, I'm definitely going to use that McDaniel quote when I'm coaching down at my wrestling gym. How'd good. I do? Well, if your goal was to be average, uh, I was really pumped about it. Josh is someone who tweets out uh, quite a bit of Mike McDaniel's quotes and just kind of follows along with them. I got to ask you, man, how often have we seen Salty McDaniel? That just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, not often. And I mean, we, again, we weren't at practice, so it sounded like it wasn't an awful day, but he expected more, it sounds like. So um, you you wanted to hear that, right? I mean, if he's not happy with them being content, wants them to push it a little bit further, just like he needs to as a head coach, I mean, why not uh, get rid of the orange jersey and sit here and say, yeah, if average is what you're striving for, then I was super pumped. To speak on the orange jersey real quick, Merrick, uh, what is what are your thoughts of maybe the idea of, you know, you mentioned Tyree Kill getting the orange jersey. I don't think it's possible for Tyree Kill to ever get the orange jersey. I kind of feel the same way about Xavier. I feel like there are some people where it's th- there's just that level of being a veteran where I think the, the perk and the bonus of being this orange jersey, I don't know if it really fits their lane. Uh, what, what do you think about that? 
So I, I do think Tyreek got it at least once last year, Was but he it? hasn't, okay. he hasn't gotten it this year. And I'm not sure Xavier and Howard has gotten it at all uh, either last year or this year. So you might be right there. And it, it might be a thing where you have to do something a little out of the ordinary and Tyreek Hill's ordinary is pretty damn good. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, same can be said for Xavier and Howard. Uh, and his performances uh, in the defensive backfield. So you might be right. It might you might need to be a, a player who who needs to prove a little something, and then you go out there and you have yourself a great day. And, and coach just wants to recognize you for that. So uh, we'll see what happens as as training camp progresses. But uh, no more joint practices with the Falcons. They're done with those. They're having a day off tomorrow, and then we get the preseason game on Friday. So. We'll, we'll see how that goes, and, and they'll get back to the practice field next week, and we'll we'll take a look at those orange jerseys again. Those guys deserve orange helmets. That's all I was going to say. They should give, uh, you know, Xavier yeah, Howard, Tyreek Kill to uh, Where's our helmets. alternate helmet? You know what I mean? Like, you got all these other teams, the Colts and the and – the, I don't know why I'm blanking on every other team considering, like, 10 teams got new helmets this – this off season, but they all get the cool alternate helmet. And then the dolphins come out and they're like, we're wearing throwbacks two times. And you're two like, wait, times, what? Yeah. Like, what? A, Twice. we want the throw throwbacks more than that. But B, I want something in addition to the throwbacks. Give us that Miami vice Jersey. That's been leaking on the internet for the past decade. You're the, being the, too picky now. The all grays. Let's get an aqua helmet or an orange helmet. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. The Jets have already lost a game. That's how you can tell it's football season, right? So I want to ask you guys, when does training camp become the preseason? Because we're sitting here two days before the Dolphins and Falcons play in the first preseason game. I mean, that is such a crazy thing to say out loud. Like, we finally made it. Where is that line? When do we officially reach the season? And when does training camp? Does training camp even end? Or is it happen during the preseason? Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll still get more training camp practices, right? I think, right? Yeah, like in the middle of the week, like they're practicing a bunch more than they would in a, the regular season. Yeah. So I would think, is it still training camp? I think so. Yeah, I think it's still training camp. I, I don't I don't think it ends. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to have to quickly find myself in midseason form Googling some illegal streams here on, on the internet so I can watch this game on Friday because I live in Iowa. And, you know, shocking, I know, but we don't get Dolphins preseason games here in Davenport, Iowa. So I always got to jump on the illegal streams. And I probably shouldn't say that on the podcast. I'm going to get an FBI agent knocking on my door tomorrow morning. You know, you know, we need to check your search history. And I'm just going to say, you don't want to do that, Mr. FBI agent. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's exciting times. We get Dolphins football and who knows if we'll see Tua. They haven't been, uh, they haven't committed to, to playing any starters as of yet. And, and Tua doesn't even know if he's playing on Friday. I think uh, Mike McDaniel's the type of coach that if you play well in the joint practices, he doesn't need to see in the preseason game. But if you leave a little more to be desired in the joint practices, then uh, you might suit up in the preseason game. So by all accounts, we might actually see some Tua Tunga Bailoa on Friday because he hasn't been as sharp as people would like him to be uh, during these joint practices and during this training camp as a whole, which is interesting to discuss, but I'm sure nobody will overreact to that sound blurb that I just gave everyone on this podcast. Josh, before we get into it, I, I just wanted to ask, does it feel real? You know, we've, we've been doing this just, I mean, nonstop throughout the off season where in reality, a lot doesn't change when we get to the regular season. I, the, welcome to the season, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I really doesn't feel real yet, right? I was trying to figure out what part, you know, your brain kicks into the, you know, regular season form. Is it going to be next week heading into that most likely dress rehearsal for week two of the preseason? I mean, that's kind of probably where I'm at. But as soon as that first game's on the Friday, we're going to be just drooling over every single play and overreacting. So, um, yeah, it doesn't feel real yet until I'm scattering around trying to get a stream like Merrick's talking about. Then that's when it really gets real and it's it's time for a regular season. This is it. The Miami Dolphins host the Atlanta Falcons this weekend in the first preseason game. Guys, I'm just going to open it up as simple as possible. What can we expect? What do we expect? I mean, Mike McDaniel, he hasn't been running the show that long. I don't know if we can really dive into tendencies from him, but how are we going to watch this game? I'll tell you, I'm certainly going to be looking at that offensive line, like we mentioned earlier. That's a, that's a sore spot on, on an otherwise stacked roster. So you want to see 
how they perform. I doubt we'll see Teron Armstead. I would I would give that a, a 0.69% chance of uh, of happening. So you're looking at probably Kendall Lamb starting at left tackle. And I'm a Lamb fan. Um, so I'd like to see how he performs. And then that left guard spot, probably the most troublesome spot along that offensive line. And, and there's, there's a job up for grabs there. And there's about four guys fighting for it. So are you going to see a Liam Eikenberg start? And then if he struggles, he gets pulled for an Isaiah win. And then where does Lester Cotton fit in there? Dan Feeney, where's he at? Um, does Robert Jones get a look? I just, I want to see what's going on at left guard. Um, I, I, I read something today that Connor Williams has actually been struggle, struggling a little bit with the Falcons D-line at center. So we'll see how he does, how Robert Hunt does. And then Austin Jackson, probably the second most troubling spot on that offensive line is that right tackle position. So I'd like to see Austin Jackson show out on Friday night. And if we can get this offensive line looking at least decent, it doesn't have to be great. It doesn't have to be top five, top 10 in the league. If it is awesome. But if we could just get a a middle of the road offensive line, I think this team and this offense could be very special. So my eyes are definitely going to be on that offensive line as well as the rookies. I want to see Cam Smith. I want to see Devon a chain and I want to see how these guys look in the aqua, in the orange and in, in the dolphins, pearly whites, And I want to see, you know, where they'll be able to contribute to this team once the regular season kicks off. Because by all accounts, both of those guys have had impressive performances all throughout training camp. So let's see if that can carry over when the reps are live and and the game kicks off on Friday night. Yeah, I think Robert Hunt and Austin Jackson were two of the guys that were in that, uh, you know, the little scrum that was going on today during camp. So maybe Austin Jackson is going to put it all together this year and be that, um, you know, the right tackle that we need. If you're looking at the offensive side, I'm definitely going to be looking at the defensive side because it sounds like every day the defense, Vic Fangio's defense is really, you know, taking over, look like the dominant force. I want to see how that, how many of those guys start, you know, what that defense looks like in their first opportunity to go out there against a team, you know, that got some dynamic players. I doubt B. John Robinson will play, Drake London, Kyle Pitts. Most of those guys probably aren't going to play, but um, say one of them does. I mean, I want to see the way this defense can go out there and try to shut those guys down. I think no Igbenogany was covering Kyle Pitts in practice today. He also had a pick six. So what's Igbenogany going to look like now in this new defense? Keter Coe, who seemed like he was uh, felt better about day one than day two. But for me, it's this defense. Are they as dominant as it sounds like they are each day in camp? And how does that translate to the field, especially when you're looking at some of those depth pieces trying to battle for a 53-man roster spot? You know, you circle, you circle those couple of weak points. Cornerback is one. And when you go into this preseason game, again, we have no idea. I, I kind of lean towards the idea that a lot of the starters aren't going to be playing. Um, that offensive line, uh, I, I do wonder if, if Connor Williams is even going to play, just if they're going to block out the veterans. I could even see a crazy world where Austin Jackson just doesn't play for some weird reason. But cornerback and defensive line are two I want to talk about uh, just because are we going to hear Cam Smith's name? And if we hear his name, is that a good or a bad thing? I think that's one opportunity um, that we're really going to get to see. I mean, a lot of us aren't in South Florida to watch all these practices and overanalyze them. Uh, But this is the opportunities that Cam Smith will have. And you mentioned Noah Igbenogny is another name that, listen, nobody's saying that he's going to come out and be this like absolute stud top 15 cornerback, but I do think there's a life there for an opportunity there for him to be a good uh, cornerback in this league, at least a stable one and compete with the Eli apples and the Nick Needham's of the world when he returns. Looking at the Dolphins depth chart last year, they kept a limited amount of defensive tackles. They really load up on those linebackers outside pass rushers. So to me, they're solidified with, with, with four locked in defensive linemen and Zach Sealer, Raekwon Davis, uh, Christian Wilkins, and of course, Emmanuel Agba. This is it, guys. Vic Fangio has been yelling that he would like some veteran help at defensive tackle. Brandon Peely, man, this is your game. This is your game. You need to have us all talking about you nonstop. Make Vic Fangio have to focus on you. That's my biggest player. I think he's going to be getting as much snaps as absolutely possible. I don't think defensive tackle in general, even on a 90-man roster, is a position you have a lot of um, – lot of bodies to really work through so i think we can we're gonna be able to identify them early but the key is can we identify them often yeah and this is going to be a great opportunity for vic fangio for mike mcdaniel even for chris greer to evaluate that interior defensive line depth you mentioned it zach sealer 
Raekwon Davis, Christian Wilkins, those positions are solidified. Those guys aren't going anywhere, but you wonder about the depth behind them. And they just released a guy, Anthony Montalvo. They signed Deshaun Hand. Um, and then you got Brandon Peely, who's been impressing in spurts and training camp. And then another guy that even Christian Wilkins was talking up uh, in one of his media availabilities in, in Jalen Twyman. Um, Jalen Twyman, I believe undrafted uh, a couple years back, kind of, you know, is, is a student of the game, according to Christian Wilkins, asking questions all the time. Uh, and Wilkins has said that that's kind of helping him out a little bit uh, because he has to stop and think about, wait, what do I do in that situation? What is my technique if uh, I, I face an offensive lineman who moves like this or looks like this or whatever? So you do like to see that. You do like to see a guy who's uh, in his playbook, studying tape, unlike uh, Johnny Manziel. Did you guys see that <laughs> on the Netflix deal where he uh, – his iPad read 0.0 hours of film watch for his entire rookie season. That was incredible. Like that's a commitment to being Impressive. awful. That's a very big commitment to being a terrible quarterback. And if that was his goal, he definitely succeeded. But uh, as far as the interior defensive line depth, you do wonder if the dolphins have enough bodies there um, or like we've talked about multiple times on this podcast, will they go fishing? Are they going to look for somebody else? And in Dominican Sue and Akeem Hicks, a Linval Joseph, um, are those guys, they, they don't, those are big boys. They don't need to be running around in the hundred degree heat in Miami during training camp and their jobs. I don't want to say they're simple cause I couldn't do it, but uh, you know, their job is to be a big giant mammoth human being that stands in the middle of a line and, and plugs up the holes and doesn't let the running backs get through. So I don't think they need a lot of practice uh, to to be able to perform that job or those roles at a high level. So you could see one of those guys brought in on a cheaper deal right before the regular season starts. But now's the time for guys like Brandon Peely, Jalen Twyman, and the others to, to show that the Dolphins don't need to do that and they don't need to go out there and spend any more of that cap space that they'd like to roll over into next season. Um, and it starts Friday against the Falcons. And we'll get to see a lot of those backup interior defensive linemen. Um, so, yeah, you're right, guys. That That's a good spot to, to keep your eyes on on Friday. Yeah, and I think they probably will eventually go fishing for defensive line depth. And, you know, they're still out there maybe fishing for another running back. I don't want to talk about it too much. But Devon A. Chain, I mean, he got a chance to reps, take reps with the second team offense. I think he probably got some first team snaps. Um, you know, yeah, Ricky Raheem Mostert set up Raheem today. Ricky Mostert yeah, sitting out. Yeah, and Salvin Ahmed. I mean, every time you see a clip or a highlight, I mean, he seems like he's making plays. So I know we've all been excited about him for some time. But um, do the Dolphins need Dalvin Cook? I mean, we're going to find out, right? I mean, Devon A. Chain if that hype that he brings to camp can translate to the field, even if it is, you know, preseason week one, I mean, that should make the Dolphins feel pretty good about what they have in that running back room. So um intrigued to see what happens there. Same with Salvin Ahmed and just this running back unit. You know, Mike McDaniel says he's happy with everyone. He loves the competition, the different skill sets they all bring. Um, is that just all talk? And is he, are the Dolphins still going to potentially go out there and nab themselves Dalvin Cook? Time to tell. What I really like about the Devon A. Chain chatter coming out of training camp um, is something that's even a little surprising to me and I think is surprising to a lot of people, but his pass protection has apparently been above average, which is surprising because he's a slight dude. He's not a big guy. He's a smaller uh, running back, and running backs are kind of small in general, but he's on the smaller end of that spectrum. So to see that he's been able – to hold his own and even do a little bit more than that in pass protection as a running back. I think that bodes well for his chances at becoming um, a solid contributor for this team this year and an even bigger contributor for this team in the future. So then of course, because of that, you take a look at the Dalvin cook saga, which is literally never ending. It's like a Lord of the Rings movie. You don't, you just, you, it just keeps dragging on. I probably offended you, Jake. I, I bet you're a Lord of the Rings guy. Are you not? Nope. No, really? <laughs> I mean, quite well, Finn Finn's cut is watching this and he's definitely a Lord of the Rings guy. Like no doubt about it. Right. Like, he's, he's listening to this right now, probably laughing and nodding his head, but, uh, but you know, Dalvin Cook with Devon A. Chain, it's, it's one practice. It's one training camp practice. But, you know, if the reports are true and his pass blocking prowess uh, is a little bit better than expected, you know, along with the combination of veterans Raheem Moster and Jeff Wilson knowing the system, 
does that decrease the chances that Dalvin Cook eventually ends up in Miami? You know, he took the visit to the Jets and everyone thought that many was signing. And well, here we are over a week later and it hasn't happened. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll have to see what happens there. But Devon A. Chain's performances as of late do seem very, very encouraging. And I, man, I'm, I'm intrigued by the speed, obviously, but just very, very happy to hear that his pass blocking has been uh, up to snuff so far. I even wonder if uh, A. Chain might be someone they just hold out. I, I really do wonder if they're just going to kind of cut off and, and focus on that second team. Uh, it's great to hear that Salvan Ahmed is being one of those guys. They kept four running backs last year. He was one of them. So um, I do think they'll probably keep four again, and then Dell and Cook would just throw an entire wrench into it. One final positional battle, and I think this is kind of an interest, interesting one when you zoom out of the forest a little bit. Um, keeping it simple, that Arthur Smith offense, I mean, they're a run-heavy system. They really like to confuse opposing defenses. Uh there's the Kyle Kyle Shanahan system and, and everything that's come out of that. This is completely different. This is a whole different animal that the Dolphins are going up against. So how about, you know, we've heard some hype about Aubrey Miller kind of calling plays on the defensive side of the football. I don't know how much uh, Jerome Baker we're going to see. I doubt we're going to see any David Long. So to me, hey, can this defense, a scheme that's kind of set up to, if there is any sort of weakness, is going to be, you know, preventing the rush. Can that group, can that linebacker unit really kind of step up a little bit and overcome the challenges that might be a Vangio defense trying to prevent this offense from really taking off? That That's going to be a great point there. It'll be good to see these young backers, uh, Aubrey Miller, Channing Tindall, um, get a look on Friday against a good rushing team. I doubt we'll see B. John Robinson, but even Tyler Algier, who was a rookie last year, uh, he's a pretty solid running back as well for the Atlanta Falcons. So it'll be a stiff test on Friday night, and we'll get a great opportunity to see if this this Vic Fangio defense is up to the test this early on um, when trying to learn the new system. Gentlemen, it has officially happened. We have finally hit the NFL season. I'm, as a commissioner, getting frustrated about drafts, ripping off my hair. But coming here, talking some football, actually brings some sanity back in my life. So I appreciate it. It's great to see you guys back. I hope everyone had a wonderful vacation. But that is all we have on this episode of Another Dolphins Podcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. I hope you have a blast watching the Falcons Dolphins. Uh, we will come back shortly after that game with some feedback, some reactions of what we saw. But until then, fins up. Fins up. Fins up.